First of all, Blue Smooth uh, listeners and viewers, I'm here with John Ellison. And I can't imagine a lot of people doesn't know John who John Ellison is, but I've, I say some kind of wonderful. He's the writer of that. Then a lot of people say, hey, that's a song. And we're Blue Smooth, we're always interested in blues and soul and all the branches that branch it out of the blues. Um, first of all, John, what brings you here in Holland? Well, I'm here working with uh, Roger. Uh, he, uh, I met him in uh, 2016. I was uh, doing a festival in Peretta, Italy, and uh, he was there, and um, uh, he really uh, liked my show. Uh, him and I, we sort of bonded when we first met. Uh, sort of like it was meant to happen, and uh, he said he would be he would love to uh do an album with me so uh i wrote this i wrote uh some songs and sent them over and uh, came over last november we started on the uh, on the album and um so i'm here now finishing it up and that's um for people know this is roger roger heister Right. I'm going to blend in what, what this, he already done in the music business. He, right. Is, okay. He produced a lot of songs from George McCray. Right, exactly. And um, it's soul. He, uh, he's, yep. he knows what you are doing and then it's... Uh, right. And, and you, 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 you knock it off, but it has your studio at home. Is there Pardon? playing going on or just... Oh yeah, no, we... Well, right now we're doing a lot of mixing, uh, redoing some of the vocals that I did last year. Because when I came over last year, uh, like a week before I arrived, I came down with a really horrible cold, and which affected my voice. And um, so um, some of the tracks that I did, I knew that I could do them better. I could have done them better, but <laughs> because of the cold, uh, it affected my singing. So I, we had to do um, a few of the tracks over. He told me you're still... Uh a splendid uh, songwriter. Oh yeah, well, uh, just to clarify things also, uh, I am not, uh, I, not only did I write Some Kind of Wonderful, uh, my group was the first group to sing, yeah. record Some Kind of Wonderful. A lot of, a lot of people uh, are not aware of that. They think uh, it was Grand Funk Railroad. No. Uh, but, um, uh, so I like to uh, make people, make it known to the, to the public that uh, Some Kind of Wonderful was first recorded uh, by a group called the Soul Brothers Six yeah. out of Rochester, New York. And I was the lead singer and songwriter for the group. Yeah, I'm, I'm, before I went over here, I just checked your Wikipedia page and right. you were um, traveling down from Canada where you were originally was born uh, down to New York and it was the no, Soul, no, Soul was, Brothers Five. Uh, no, but I was not born in oh. Canada. <laughs> well, you know, a, a uh, dual citizen. Yeah, I was actually born in West Virginia, in the coal fields, and uh, okay. I I moved to Canada uh, in 1972 because I met um, I was booked in Canada uh, by a promoter out of Atlantic City, New Jersey, and when I arrived in uh, Canada for the engagements. Uh, the promoter there really fell in love with my band and he wanted to book me exclusively in Canada. Okay. So I ended up um, working in Canada and actually at the time I was living in Philadelphia. And uh, so when I went to Canada, I was working there so much, uh, I just decided uh, uh, to become a landed immigrant. I took out papers. Uh, so it's like a green card in the U.S. And I ended up um, being in Canada, working there all the time. And I eventually um, this became a Canadian citizen. But um, uh, I wanted to become a Canadian citizen. I, well, I could have become a Canadian citizen five years after I had been in Canada. But at the time, the laws in Canada were... If I became a Canadian citizen, I had to give up my U.S. citizenship, which I was not about to do. So then about 15 years ago, 
uh, no, 20 years ago, they passed a law. They changed the law saying that if anyone was in Canada as a, a permanent resident, you could apply to become a Canadian citizen and also keep your U.S. passport, U.S. citizenship. So that's what I did. So You clarified it perfectly. <laughs> Thank you for that. Oh, no problem. <laughs> But then, um, well, let's go back to 1967. Okay. And I saw some video footage, and you, you said, I wrote the song in 20 minutes. Yeah, that's correct. And that probably changed your life after that. Yeah, it, uh, the story behind Some Kind of Wonderful is uh, when I was in Rochester, New York, uh, and I became... Uh, a member of this, where well, they were called, the, at first this group was called the Brothers Four. It was uh, four brothers, and then uh, they added another one, they came, then that became the Brothers Five, and then I joined the band, and then we changed the name to the Soul Brother Six. And I joined the group only on one condition. Uh, I told them that I was never planning on working a day job, And that music was my only was going to be my only uh, livelihood, and uh, so they all had the same dreams and goals as I had, and so we, I joined the group and started writing songs, and and we finally, eventually, we got a record deal. But how that came about was, we were a house band playing every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and. Uh, Someone told me that I had a twin brother in Rochester, New York, and um, a lookalike. A lookalike. Yeah, that, that there was a guy that lived in Rochester that looked exa looked exactly like me. Well, eventually, this rumor got around to this guy's girlfriend, and so she came to the club <laughs> to see this guy that looked like her boyfriend, and. Uh, uh, That's how we met, and so eventually we started seeing each other, <laughs> and um, so she knew what she was liking. Well, when she she uh, she got my attention, and by sticking her foot out in the aisle as I was walking by, <laughs> and I almost tripped over it, and uh, and I said, "Oh, I'm sorry." So she said, "No, I did that on purpose." She said, "I wanted to talk to you," and I said. Um, Really, she said, yeah, she said, I heard that uh, that the guy that played in this band looked like my boyfriend, and I wanted to see what this, if someone looked like my boyfriend, and I just made a joke. I said, well, if you look like me, he's a good-looking guy. <laughs> so I said, maybe I should take his place. <laughs> and uh, so we started seeing each other, and, uh, <laughs> and then... Um, you still know the girl's name? Ann White. So Anne White is yeah. the she was the, the the trigger to write the song right, and um, at the same time there was a guy that uh, had a little small record label, and he was out of Philadelphia, and he drove a mail truck back and forth from Rochester to Philadelphia, and he would come to the club where we were performing, and he approached my group and said, "You guys are awesome. I'd like to manage you." And uh, he said, uh, I'd like to record you. Well, he sent for us and asked us to come to Philadelphia. And so the last night in Rochester, New York, I called up Ann and I told her, I said, this is my last night here in Rochester. I'd love to get together with you. And um, as about four o'clock that morning, I told her, I said, you are some kind of wonderful. <laughs> I said, I'm gonna write a song about you. And that's how the song came about. She packed me a lunch, <laughs> and the guys came by to pick me up about six o'clock that morning, and uh, uh, in route to Philadelphia, uh, I got hungry. I ate the sandwich, and I took the bag, and I started writing on the bag. I don't need a whole lot of money, and the reason I wrote I don't need a whole lot of money, well, at the time we were broke, we had no money, and. Uh, Then I said, I don't need a big fine car. The car that we were riding in, you could look through the floor <laughs> and see the highway. So then I said, I got everything a man could want. I was referring to 
And so that's how the song came about. You were just describing your situation. Exactly. That's no what, more, no less. Yep, yeah, that's what I was doing. And uh, Still wondering if you have the bag left there. No, the I've was. been asked that many times. I no. think that would be a, a, yeah. something in a, in a hot rock cafe or in a yeah. museum. <laughs> that would be. That so. would be something. No. That, <laughs> You don't I'm think sure. you don't think about that, of course. No, I, I didn't, and I knew some kind of wonderful was a hit the moment I wrote it. I knew it was a hit, but what uh, I didn't imagine was that my song would be recorded over and over and over and over. So, uh, and when most people, when they hear some kind of wonderful, they think about Grand Funk Railroad. But uh, the song was seven years old when Grand Funk Railroad recorded it. A lot of songs were mostly yeah, because, older when they get well, a breakthrough in the world. Well, what happened was Grand Funk Railroad used to listen to a lot of black music. Because when we recorded it, our version was released on Atlantic Records, but it was only played on black radio stations. Throughout the U.S., it was only on black radio stations. And um, Grand Funk Railroad used to listen to a lot of black music. And that's, they ended up playing, uh, they used to play my song in the clubs when they were a bar band. And it was not uncommon for, uh, uncommon for a lot of rock bands to, right, exactly. to, to, do, to tap in that uh, right. music and get a lot of Led Zeppelin there, but a lot of blues. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, uh, that's how it became exposed to the white world. Uh, it was by Grand Funk Railroad. Prior to Grand Funk Railroad recording it, It was recorded by another black artist out of Philadelphia in 1969. His name, they call him Fantastic Johnny C. And uh, his version, again, was only played on black radio stations because he was African American. And uh, then Grand Funk Railroad, and when Grand Funk Railroad recorded it in 1974, uh, it became known to the white world, and then One group after another, they just started recording it. So today, Some Kind of Wonderful has been recorded by 67 artists. It's, and it's actually the most recorded song in music history. No other song has been recorded by that many different artists. And well, congratulations for that. Thank you. But, but now, not only the song is recorded a lot of artists, there's also a lick in this in the music that has been covered or been sampled a lot yes. of times. In a lot of in the the rap world was known for yeah. sampling all of the stuff. And and I came to do I, I I wrote that that was also the lick you were playing on the guitar. Right, right, right. And also. Um, I think writing a song, writing lyrics, if you just met a girl you were um, you were liking, yeah. is different than getting the music with it. Well, uh, Or is that a similar process? Well, it's a sim. A, it depends. Sometimes I will, uh, uh, I will get a nice groove, and then I write lyrics around it. Then another time I might uh, have a, a title. And then I create the song, and I put the melody to it, and then I put the music to it afterwards. So, are you always open for uh, people who are giving you pointers, maybe to change the lyric or the, the thing, like the the band you were in? No, the band that I, the bands that I was with, they basically relied on me uh, to write the songs because they. Uh, they were great musicians, but in terms of writing, they didn't have writing skills. Uh, so they were basically followers. Could you also, um, so you also did, directed the drummer and the bass player? I did, and the, yes, the, the everything player. that you hear in my songs, and especially with any song that I write, I arrange them. I arrange the bass, I arrange the drums, uh, anything that happens in a song. And... Uh, I did the, the boom, 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 boom. That was my, the drums. I showed the drummer how I wanted him to play it. I told the uh, the group what I, how I wanted the background, the backup vocals to go. So everything you hear in that song is me. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you how I came up with the beat. Uh, there was a song by uh, the Supremes that I really liked. 
and it was called, it went like this, baby, 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 don't leave me. And, and I always liked that song, and it, and, the, and it was a, baby, 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 don't leave me. So I was listening to that, beat and I said, you know what I'm going to do? And I'm going to keep the same tempo, but then I'm gonna, instead of the bass going, boom, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to double up the bass, I'm going to go, boom, 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 boom. So that's how I came up with the, with the beat. Of some kind of wonderful. I always love it when um, people say they rip off a songs, but it is just an inspiration. Yeah, everybody is an inspiration for somebody else. Yes, exactly. So I just I, I listened to that boom boom, and then I said, okay, I'm going to keep the same tempo, but I'm going to go boom 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 boom. So I created the bass line. I, the only thing that I used was different that, that I didn't get was the tempo of the song. It was the one, two, one, two. I just put bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, ba bump, and I changed the the, the drums. <laughs> can you can you remember if you made a lot of versions of it or it was just as you had it imagined and you had recorded it and it was done? No, that was it. It was done. I that was the only That was the, the, the groove I created, and uh, the words fit perfect to it, and uh, that was it. You told me that, you, um, that your song was initially only played on black radio stations. Yeah, that's correct. Um, were you performing? Were that also black clubs? We played... Music? Or is uh, it, is it, was it everywhere? In the, in well, the we were... Uh, when the song was released, uh, we did basically... Uh, we played, for example... The Apollo Theater in New York, which is black. We okay. played um, um, in uh, Philadelphia. We played at the uh, all the places that we played. Uh, they were whether well, they were arenas or whatever. The crowds that came were black. They were all black. How many attendants was in the arena? What the, for, um, for my view. I'm going to say we played in the uh, a place in Philadelphia called the Spectrum. Yep. Uh, the Spectrum Hill, it was, I'm going to say, maybe two, three thousand people. Well, it's, yeah. That's good. Yeah. So uh, the we played it in the Apollo, I would say, on um, probably close to a thousand people in the Apollo. Um, Then we played at a, a fest outdoor uh, event. It was called the Robin Hood Dell. And the same thing, it was a like, really large outdoor place. And then the segment became it nationwide or was it still in the Northwest? Basically in the North, Northeast. Northeast. We played like uh, Washington, D.C., uh, Philadelphia. Uh, we played in Ohio. We played um, uh, Indiana. We played in Quebec, Canada, okay. um, London, Ontario, Canada, Detroit. Um, I can you can you remember when you um, made a crossover when a when a more wide audience was respecting the music? Um, that was in 1968. We started playing. <laughs> You remember it. <laughs> yeah. We, we started playing in uh, some white clubs. Uh, but at the time, uh, during the time period, although we were playing in these white clubs, we were not allowed to mingle with the, uh, with the, with the, with the, pe the people that came into the club. We had a section where we sat and we were not allowed to congregate with anyone else. Uh, that was um, part of being black. So, yeah, I'm. That's one thing I've um, picked up on your Wikipedia page. That you, I don't know if you wrote a book about it, but there was a lot of racism going on. And I, oh yeah, I guess it's still going on. But racism is still going on today. It isn't. The only thing that's changed is time. <laughs> so. Well, I, I guess there is a. At, well, let's put it this way. Um, 
it is not as uh, blatant as it was in the 60s, uh, in the 60s, in the 50s, because um, I was not even allowed. I, I never went into a restaurant and sat down until I was uh, in my 20s. In West Virginia, where I was born, uh, I had never been in a restaurant uh, to eat. Um, um, school I went to was a segregated school. Uh, wasn't born in a hospital because blacks weren't allowed to be born in a hospital. So, um, so if something went wrong, went wrong. If something went wrong, it went wrong. That's right. So, and and I know because I'm a I'm a radio host for a blues radio station. Right. Sometimes we do some research and things we love. And I was in Memphis. When in the 60s there was some rioting uh, in, yeah, the, in the I, days of Martin Luther King. Yeah, well, there were riots. And if you see the pictures of it, yeah. there's always in it white, non whites. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's. Uh... And I also can, and um, that brings us maybe back to the music, that uh, BB um, King was booked for the first time in the Fillmore West, it was, in San Francisco, and he said, What what I have to. He didn't know what he has to do in that. White joint with white youngsters, and he played one or two songs, and they went wild. Yeah, and, and suddenly he was hip in that in that scene. Right, and that that brought a, a probably a lot good for a lot of um, blues artists also. Right, of course. Um, but you're still writing. You're still active as a writer, a music singer. Oh yeah, yeah I'm still. Active. And. I will, I will, if I get footage of a video, I will, I will blend it in. That you did a, um, a show in France or in Italy, in Italy, and there was a 13 piece band on stage. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was. Um, you not take it lightly if you be on stage, I guess. It has to sound good. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm good at what I do. singers. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, that in 2016, I'm sorry, well, in 2016, I performed in Peretta, the Peretta Soul Festival. And then again, I was in uh, Peretta in 2018, Soul Festival. I think there's something like 80,000 people it was at my show. It was, uh, and then I went to the Canary <laughs> Islands, there was over 100,000 at my show there. So. And now you're in a small hotel in Cruise Bay, Netherlands. Yeah. yeah, and enjoying every minute of it. Uh, working on some great music with Roger, and uh, who's a great guy. He's a great human being as well as a great producer. Him and I, we are doing some amazing work together. Yeah, I'm. I'm really curious uh, about, about what it is. Uh, it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> It's going to be a blockbuster. I think it's always good that people, uh, despite their age, never give up the music they love. And if they're well, writing, if they're healthy, they go. Oh, exactly. I mean, I don't. I can't see myself. Um, like I said, I'm in great health. I mean, I'm not sick, and uh, I love what I'm doing. And uh, there's no reason to give it up. Isn't that an important thing? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about maybe that, that, that big song, the world song. Uh, okay. Um, were you clever enough to uh, register the rights? I, I, well, that's <laughs> what I told you. I never had to have a day job. So you were clever enough. I was clever enough. <laughs> because there are a lot of stories from people who were in, well, no, not paying attention no, to I'm some, not one some of record those. companies. Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the story behind me. It wasn't that I was so smart because it was not. I was just as naive as any other young uh, artist starting out in the business. But I was, uh, and I always tell people, you know, God watches over you. Uh, I met a gentleman in Philadelphia in 1967. Okay, his name was Harold Lipsius. And uh, he, uh, I signed with him as a songwriter and uh, he, had, he, he said if I signed with him as a songwriter, that he would make me a lot of money. And, That's uh, what he all said. And uh, yeah, but he was a man of his word. That's good. I signed with him and uh, he explained the publishing to me, uh, the uh, songwriters, royalties, 
and uh, he assisted me in um, signing up with BMI, uh, and um, and I signed with him, and um, he has he's put my music all over the world, and I have been receiving eight checks a year since 1967. So I've never had to have a day job. I've um, been blessed that I have uh, earned a, a really great living off of my music, and uh, I'm still earning money off of it. And I'm still, I'm still just smiling when you hear that song on the radio somewhere or in. A, well, were you, were you? You know, you, I, I smile, but um, it's not because of uh, a financial gain no. from it. It's because. When I smile, I think back to where I came from. I was born in the coal fields of West Virginia. And um, people told me that I was crazy. Uh, I was dream, it was a pipe dream that uh, I needed to get a job and go to work like everybody else. And um, I relish in the fact that I didn't listen to anyone <laughs> and that I followed my dreams and my heart and uh, I'm doing what I like to do. I don't have a boss, never had anyone telling me what I, you know, I've been my own boss all my life and I've traveled the world and I'm still traveling the world and uh, I'm doing great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> sure you do. Um, what was your education? Did you uh, musically school? By, no, uh, no. My, my musical education was a gift from God. I was born with a gift to write songs. My father owned a guitar, and I picked it up one day, and I played. The first thing I played on it was "My Body Lies Over the Ocean," and I played that, and I said. Wow, this is easy. <laughs> and from that point, I just, every day I would pick up that guitar and I'd play something else on it. And I just kept playing until I started learning chords and and then I started writing songs. And You, uh, you can write the, 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 the notes? No, the notes? I play by ear. You play by ear? Yeah, I can play anything that anyone else play. You know, all I can, I can hear it one time and I can play it. So if you have to introduce it to a band member, you have to play it in front of them or sing it? Yeah, I just... Uh, uh, you can't give them it, the sheet music? No, no, I, I will tell them, give them, I'll give them the chord changes and they already know the beat. So um, I, I, can, I, I can't write music, but I can, I can tell you if it's a G minor, G sharp or G you're, major you're seven. Is still flawless? Oh, my, I have... I'm in perfect health. I'm on no medication whatsoever. I never drank in my life. I've never touched drugs in my life. I puffed on a few cigarettes when I was a teenager, and I dropped that. So um, uh, I'm in great shape. I got 20-20 vision, so I'm fine. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Yep. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm in great shape. John, you have a. A perfect story. I love it to, to bring it to our listeners on the radio. Yeah, well, it's a, it's it's a pleasure. I and uh, I mean, I have you. If you really heard my story, I'd be you and I'd be here all night because uh, there's also as as much as I have uh, been blessed in what I'm telling you. Uh, there's this dark side of my life that. Uh, 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 dealing with racism and discrimination. Well, and I'm probably you know, I decide what I do on the radio, but I yeah. always, we always have, we always uh, also have a YouTube channel. Right. I will put it on there. So if you, uh, yeah, no well, uh, just to give you some, some insight into my life, when I was in West Virginia and I uh, and I had made up my mind that music was going to be my profession. Uh, uh, the first encounter I had with racism was when I um, uh, there was a radio program in uh, near the, the where I lived in the town near where I lived, 
and there was this uh, contest, and the winner of this contest was going to win $500 and a trip to New York to record. And uh, I entered this contest, and I was the only uh, black person in the in the room. Uh, and when I um, signed up for it, I before I, I practiced and practiced, and uh, I wanted to I make sure that I was good enough to win this contest. <laughs> you came prepared. So I came prepared. So um, when I um, was when my name was called, and uh, there was this intercom, a speaker above the door where the judges were. You had to go into this other room. So when they called my name, and I walked into the room with my guitar, and he said, what are you gonna sing? And I said, well, I'm gonna sing a song by Chuck Berry. And I started singing School Days by Chuck Berry. And um, as soon as I started singing, one of the judges raised his hand, and he said, that's it, we got a winner. And uh, I knew I was great. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, he said, this contest is over. He said, we have a winner. And uh, when I walked out of that room, uh, they had forgotten to turn off that intercom. So as yeah. soon when I, the door closed and I walked out, this one guy said, what do you mean we got a winner? And the other guy said, well, who can be better than this guy? This guy is great. And he said, I don't care how good he is. He's a goddamn nigger. And he said, there's no way in hell we're going to let a nigger win this contest. And uh, I was 16 years old when I heard that. It's not good for your confidence. And uh, well, I explained to you. So okay. for me, I was not prepared for that. It was almost like somebody took a knife and put it through me. Because never in my wildest dreams did I expect to lose this contest because of the color of my skin. If I had lost it because I wasn't good enough, I could have accepted that. And if I lost because I cheated or did something wrong, I could accept that. But I lost because of something I couldn't change. I couldn't change my color. And that's why I lost. But what it did for me, uh, tears came into my eyes you know, I was because I was devastated, but I also got angry, and I said, "You think you're stopping me?" I said, yeah. "I'm going to show you. You can't stop me." That was my attitude, and I left out, and I, I made a vow. One day, you're going to realize that guy that you didn't let win this contest is going to make history. And so that's what it did for me. Ever went back and said, I told you so? Well, I'll tell you, I was back in that little town um, three years ago. And I'm very good friends with the mayor of that town. So the mayor of this town said to me, the name of the town is Welch, West Virginia. So the mayor said to me, John, that you have a big fan here that really wants to meet you. And she said, he owns WELC radio station. That was the grandchild of the man that said to me, there's no way in hell a nigga is going to win this contest. So his grandson, he's dead. So his grandson owns this radio station, and he came down to the courthouse to meet me. And he said, he doesn't know anything about that. He just he came to me, he says, Mr. Ellison, I just want to meet you. You are an inspiration. I love your music. And he said, the fact that you're from West Virginia, he said, I am so honored to meet you. And I smiled to myself. <laughs> And I thought about what his grandfather had said to me. So, <laughs> it was a proud moment. Karma, you know. I think there's not enough karma for what some people did. 
Yeah, and uh, <laughs> so I didn't say to him, you know, well, you know, your grandfather says this. I said, you know, pleased to meet you, and uh, that's it. And that was the 60s. How was the 70s evolving in, in, in towards racism? The 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, I told you, only thing has changed in good old America is time. And is, I can, I is, can, is there really a difference between Europe and America? Well, how people react to the color of your skin? I don't know because I, I don't live in Europe, so I don't know how it is. No, here. And if you were here over for performing, they treat you? Oh, I, I mean, in terms of, of me performing here, I've had nothing but the, I got a lot of friends in Europe, a lot. I've never experienced any racism whatsoever here. Uh, I don't know how it is for everyday people of, of color that live here, but I can tell you. Anyway, see, because I'm looked upon as, when I come to Europe, as somebody special. As an artist. You know, I'm an artist. Um, uh, they roll out the red carpet for me, but I don't really know, so I can't speak on, uh, like, if I live to you, how things would be socially or whatever. So I, I've never... I guess we have our flaws. Yeah, I, I've never had it. So all I know is that when I come here, I'm treated with respect. I'm treated with the highest honor, you know, not just here, but Italy, France, Germany, anywhere I go, yeah. I, I'm, you know, I'm treated great. Starting out in the 60s, in the 70s and the 80s, when uh, album sales were important, then came the CDs, then right. came in the early um, 2000s, it went over slowly to the internet. How are you coping with that? Um, but that changed because the, the sales are not that great in the, anymore about new albums. Well, I have not been, um, no, I, I don't depend on albums uh, for my uh, uh, well-being. Um, my earnings come from my songwriting. So whether I record or not, you know, it's neither here nor there for me. Okay. Because uh, you see, the big bands have now to perform to get the box in. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I've been told. Uh, and plus, uh, CDs are basically obsolete. You know, they're not. People still make CDs, but uh, and they sell them at concerts. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of them being uh, a way of like being high in sales like they used to be. Uh, no, it's not a... It's because there's, you know, technology, everything has changed, streaming, uh, you know, the way people... So there's no economical urge for you to write new songs, but it's just the creative, the creative uh, process that you like and still... Right, yeah. No, it's... Uh, put it out in the world for you. Right, exactly. So, which will mean if I want to, uh, like... If I wanted to tour, um, you know, I can tour. Um, I also, um, I also own a food company called Some Kind of Wonderful Foods. <laughs> and uh, why is that based in Florida? It's based in Florida. Yeah, but I have product. Okay, I have product in six hundred and fifty-one stores right now. Uh, for, where are you living now, in Florida? I have a home in Canada still. And uh, I live in Florida. That's my wife. Of, uh, okay. Uh, actually, we've known each other 50 years. I met her in 1968 when um, uh, to be with a white woman was uh, almost a death sentence. But again, I've always lived my life. You can't tell me. Still, the, the, the movies we see in, in of that area are true. The burning crosses in the garden and you know. Oh yeah. What I, there was a new film out now, Black Clansman. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I've I, I was halfway through. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's my way. Ah. That's my heart. And the rest is <laughs> grandchildren. Aww. Yeah, that's my grand. That's my grand. Say hi to Grandpa. <laughs> well, in yeah. a couple of days, you're back. Yeah, I'll be home in a few days. So, um, 
I guess. I'll send you some of my spice. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm for it. Yep. I'm, I'm for it. Do that. We, we, we will uh, keep in touch with Roger. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm, I've, I've, I've been a couple of times over there and always bring spices with me. Oh, and okay. I know um, I've seen Taj Mahal a couple of times. Oh, yeah. Taj Mahal, yeah. And he, I know from somebody who was, there's a blues cruise where he is right. a regular guest on, and he's always bring a big bag of spices because he's preparing. Oh, the zone stuff on, on board and it's oh, okay. all Cajun based. So right. A lot of well, my, when I say spice, a lot of people think, uh, and I f I found this uh, especially when uh, white customers buy my product. Uh, <laughs> prior to them buying it, uh, because if they think I made it, they immediately think it's spicy, it's hot, and my product is not. No, it, it doesn't have, it have to be. No, but a lot. Of, but I'm just saying this is the. Uh, when I'm talking to someone, if I, uh, for example, if uh, I'm doing a demonstration in a store and I say, hey, I got something great, try this. If, it, if there's a white person, is a, especially women, white women, <laughs> they will say, no, 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 it's too spicy. And I said, you didn't taste it. <laughs> uh, how can you say it's spicy? <laughs> they said, well, isn't it spicy? I said, no, it's not spicy. Try it. And then they'll try it. Oh my God, this is delicious. And then they buy it. But that's, uh, that's women. But white men is different because white guys like spicy stuff anyway, you know, a lot of them. Yeah, but I, I, I like spices that bring out the food better. Yeah, but. Uh, and if it is numbing, my yeah, like no, taste is yeah, good. Yeah, I know. And then for me, I'm the same way. But uh, no, my product is nice, not spicy at all. It's just got a great flavor. And it's 12 herbs. And we got a. A similar history in Holland because yeah. um, we brought spices to the West. Right, exactly. The Dutch were pretty good in that to steal all the spices from uh, Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. And the East Indonesian, a lot of well, Indonesian in Holland, and they, they like to spice well, see, it up. They, well, they, they uh, invented it. Right. Well, Caucasians, uh, uh, Americans, uh, they think uh, because a lot of uh, people from the islands. From Jamaica, you know, yeah, they're, they're. Their, their food is hot. It's, it's very spicy. So if uh, if a black person is making has a product, Cajun and Creole yeah, cooking, they they think it's right away it's spicy, you know. So. Well, interesting. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm seeing. I'm, I'm trying to make a mental picture of you in a, in a big mall, shopping mall. Well, I, I, presenting in, in, well, I don't in, do in that a box office and then said, Well, I did that in the beginning when I first started my product, but uh, it's in supermarkets now all over, and uh, I don't have to do that anymore. But I, starting out, I did because uh, I wanted people to get to know the product. It worked. Yeah. I hope you just worked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're a man of many tales and uh, many trades. Well, I've, <laughs> I've been told, you know, that. Uh, my life story, uh, and, and at some point Roger and I were talking, um, my life is a movie. You know? Yeah, but I, I was, when you were t yeah. uh, telling me you're 16 year old and you were deciding yourself, I'm going to show you that, that's yeah. a definitive moment in somebody's yeah. life. And, and, yeah, and I was also arrested um, uh, <laughs> in a bus terminal. I, was, I used to work from 11 o'clock at night to 7 in the morning, and I would take my guitar uh, to work with me and practice during the night when I wasn't busy and when um, and again I was 16 years old when this happened I was at the bus station waiting on um, the bus and uh, these white girls came through the bus terminal they went that way to go to school and they saw me with my guitar and they asked me if I knew how to play it and I said yeah so they said uh, can you play us a song so I said sure so I started playing it and next thing I know the, the manager of the bus station, he came out and saw me playing guitar. He wouldn't call the police. And the police came and took my guitar, broke it, and threw me in jail. Said I was disturbing the peace. <laughs> playing a song. Yep. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hard to imagine. Hard to imagine. Well, that's why. I, is, is, that that's, what, is that what's coming from that you're now playing with, an, uh, with a necklace guitar? No. Or whatever it is. <laughs> no, I bought that guitar. I've seen bass guitars, but not yeah. so many. In well, no, I bought that guitar because uh, I've, um, my traveling, 
Uh, I've had a few guitars broken because uh, even though you put them in flight cases, they would take them and throw them underneath. I've seen uh, a lot of guitar players that stories, and now they focus yeah. on Facebook with the same story. So I, uh, I, bought, I saw this little small guitar one, and I took and tried. It. I said, "Wow, this thing's great!" So I bought it. So I got several of them now. It's, uh, you know, you can take them right on the plane and put them over here, or I can put them right beside me in the seat and so. It's more convenient. Yeah, and I don't have to worry about it when I arrive somewhere to perform that it's broken. <laughs> so that's why I, that's the reason for the small guitars. John, I'm going to call it quits for, for today, but I'm it's absolutely delighted that you were uh, taking the time for uh, you know, sure. have well, a short interview. We were just interrupting your all sessions, but oh, that's okay. it's a great story and I'm absolutely sure that people uh, yeah. that listen to our radio station or watch our YouTube channel are going to love it. Okay. And it's now in the, out for a uh, everybody to see well that's great I appreciate you uh, being interested in, in, in doing an interview with me always yeah and uh, let's keep in touch no no, no problem just for the spices but yeah you'll get it <laughs> not a problem <laughs>